invite you to stop by our hospitality room right after the service today. That's to my right behind the French doors in the back. So you can just stop right by there. Our pastors will be there after the service, give you a chance to meet them and ask any questions that you might have. But we'd love to see you back there after the service as well. The church family, are you glad to have our visitors this morning?
church, you believe that God is good. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's sing this chapter. You're never going to let me die. You're never going to let me die. You're never going to let me die.
busy world. And I think sometimes we put our faith in the wrong places. We put our faith in maybe our own power or in the power of other people. But as followers of Jesus, we got to remember that our faith and our confidence should be in God. Because he's the creator of all things, the creator of the mountains and the trees, and of you and me. And we can depend on him no matter what life brings our way. Because, you know, that bridge, it talks about this. It says, I'm going to trust your word. I'm going to trust your ways. Because even when I run, and even when I forsake, you don't. That's the truth. That's the promise that God has placed upon us that no matter what happens, he will walk through the storms of life with us. No matter what comes, he will stand firm. And so, you know, in whatever season of life you're in, I encourage you to trust in God because of who he is. That's what I'm looking at They never fail. What you say is true, remains true throughout all of time. God, we're about to study your word. We're about to hear what you've written for us. And that's just a privilege that we thank you for. So God, help us to listen to what you have to say, to learn about you and grow and follow you. We love you, God, and we pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Go to Ephesians chapter 5 in the New Testament, Ephesians. And uh, so if you got your Bible or your device, Bible's on your device, go to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter number 5. Um, hey, real quick, on the front of your handout at the bottom, there is a baptism class coming up. So if you're interested in being baptized December 13th, we're going to have a baptism event. But in order to do that, you need to go to the class first. It's going to be November 29th, a couple weeks from now, at either 9 o'clock or 1030. So like you would go to that right now and maybe go to the early service at 9 and then go to the baptism class at 1030. Also, there's one on Wednesday night, December 2nd. If that works better for you Wednesday night, then you can go to the class then. And so they're going to answer a lot of questions that you might have about baptism, what it's all about. Uh, why should I do it? Do I need to do it? Do you have to be baptized to go to heaven? Uh, which I can already tell you that, no. But, uh, but you know, they'll, they'll show you why that is. Um, so anyway, that's, that's great. Uh, just fill that out. Uh, fill out the card and then drop it either at the Welcome Center on your way out or in the offering boxes at the doors when you exit. And that way you'll be signed up for the class. Um, and so we are going to uh, continue here our series on the family, and we're going to wrap it up today. There are two things in life that are inevitable. Inevitable, all right? You're not going to change this. And that two things are inevitable for every one of us in here. I, really, whether you're married or single, this is true. Change is inevitable. Okay? Change is inevitable. Things never stay the same. You know? Boy, I tell you what. Could we have imagined everything that happened in 2020 back in January, huh? <laughs> change is inevitable. And in, in, in many ways, change is a good thing. I mean, like, for example, my little grandson, Connor, he's three years old. He's so cute. And little Connor, you know, says the cutest things. 
and he acts so cute. And it's like, you know, what's your favorite color? Orange. -a. He makes orange three syllables, you know. Orange. -a. And you just look at him and you think, oh, have you ever thought, why do they have to grow up? It's, it's so cute, cute. You just want to pinch their cheeks, you know. But the truth is, if 20 years from now he's still acting and talking like a three-year-old, we're concerned, amen? <laughs> you know, change is inevitable. Change is good. Now, the other thing that's inevitable in your life are trials. There's no such thing as a trouble-free life. That's not such a good thing on the surface, is it? We don't, want, we don't like trials. We don't like problems. Good things, though, come out of trials if we allow them to. And so I want to talk about marriage in light of those two things. Because marriage does not change those two facts. Marriage does not change the fact that, that change and trials are inevitable. In other words, some people think that are single. They think, if I could just find the right person, and if I could just get married, that will be the answer to all my problems in life. If I could just get married, I'll never have a bad day again. Get married and come see me in 10 years. Amen? All right. Marriage does not change the fact that you're going to have change in trust. What marriage does, marriage simply means that you have a soulmate, you have a best friend, to walk through those times with you. You go through the trials, you go through the changes together. For example, Denise and I, we were single. And then we dated for a while, and then we got married. That was a change. Then we were married, and uh, we, were, we were married with no kids for several years. Then we were married with one child, and we were that way for seven years. Then we were married with two, two kids. <laughs> Seven years later, we were married with two kids. Then, real quickly, we were married with three kids. <laughs> and then we were married with, with two kids at home. Clint got married. So we got, we got a daughter-in-law, which was a wonderful thing. Precious. <laughs> wonderful. And so we were married with two kids at home. Then we were married with one child at home. Then we were empty nesters with no kids home. Then we were married with one kid at home. <laughs> then we were empty nesters. Then we were married with one kid at home. <laughs> okay, so what I'm trying to say is that change is inevitable, whether you're married or not. Unfortunately, many married couples allow change and trials to separate them rather than walking through those together and, and getting closer through the changes and trials of life. In other words, a lot of couples, they move away from each other. They do this, and they drift apart during times of change or trials. They drift apart rather than coming together and walking through those together. Through the years, Denise and I, you know, we've had our share of change and trials. Um, I think about the first two years of our marriage. You know, and man, the first two years we got married, I, I, I was still in school, college. I had two more years. She'd already graduated. So she was the main breadwinner. She taught school. And so she's teaching school. She got deathly sick in those first two years uh, for a period of time. Nobody could figure out, no doctors could figure out what was wrong with her. She was bedridden. I mean, she couldn't get out of bed. And finally, after quite a while, they finally figured out that she had mono. She taught junior high school, probably picked it up from a water fountain, right? And so she got mono and was very, very sick. Also in those first two years, we miscarried our first child up in Jacksonville. We miscarried our child at home. Then I was finishing my ministry training, and we had no clue where we were going to go less than two years into our marriage. Didn't know what we were going to do. Well, we ended up a position open at this church. So we came here to Daytona. We took a position here as an assistant pastor. So again, a change. We moved from Jacksonville to here. Then we had our first child six months later. 
Um, so life is full of changes. That's all in the first two years. And then, uh, you know, within those first five years, we moved three times. We had our first child. I joined a singing group, and which meant that we were, you know, I was gone a lot on the weekends, which created marital problems and marital conflict in our marriage. So I quit the singing group, and I'm like, forget that. And so I, I stayed home, and so we worked through that. Soon, uh, in our extended family, it was turned upside down. Um, and in the midst of all that, I became the senior pastor of this church. All this is within the first five years of our marriage. So I could go on and on, but you guys did not come here this morning to hear about my life problems, did you? <laughs> you didn't come here to hear my bio, okay? I, I get that. But I just wanted to spend a couple minutes to let you know that, hey, we know something about change and trial. Just because you're a pastor doesn't mean that you uh, lead some kind of trouble-free life. God puts this bubble around you and everything's perfect. No, we've been through our share of changes and trials. So, you know, years ago when we first got married, Denise and I decided that we would base our lives upon the Bible, upon God's Word. And that served us very well. And... This morning, I want to share with you some Bible lessons that we have learned along the way that will, because some of you are, you're behind us in this obstacle course called life, uh, and, and some of you are ahead of us, some of you are behind us, some of you are young married, you're just getting started, some of you are not married yet, but you hope to be married, and so what I'm going to share with you are some things that we've learned from the Bible that has allowed us to, after 30 years of marriage, to navigate through the trials and all the many changes, all the bends that li and, and curves that life gives you, how do you navigate through those successfully and stay strong in your marriage? And so I, I want to share some of that with you. I want to give you four principles from Ephesians 5. They're all rooted in Ephesians 5. The first one is this. If you're taking notes, number one is no matter the change or the trial, as a couple, you have to keep Spending time together. And what I mean by that is this. Married couples, listen to me. If you allow whatever the change is in your life, if you know, it could be having a child, it could be moving, it could be whatever. But if you allow the change or you allow a trial in your life to separate you on a daily basis. In other words, you're just not together most of the time. Your marriage will greatly suffer. And unfortunately, it may not make it. You cannot allow it to separate you. And here's the deal. Sometimes change and trials separate us, and it's not even necessarily for bad reasons. For example, let's say you get a new job in a new area of the country and you got to move. Something that some people have done and, and do is one of the spouses may go ahead for months or weeks while the other spouse stays behind. And again, we rationalize, well, we want to let the kids finish their school year. Or we're going to let you stay behind until the house sells. And that may make sense on the surface. But it may not be the best decision for your marriage. Why? Because you're going through great change in your life, and you're separated most of the time from each other. And that's probably not healthy for a number of reasons. Just remember this. Remember what God's word says. Ladies, you really need to remember this verse. It is not good for a man to be alone. <laughs> okay? You get all kinds of mischief. So it is not good for a man to be alone. I, I would, you know, so what do you do? Well, you may tell, you may tell your new employer, hey, uh, I can't come till this day. And that's when the whole family can come together, you know? And he may say, great, that's fine. You can work remotely or that'll work, no problem. You know, you, you may decide as a, as a couple, hey, we do have to go now, but you know what? We're going to let the kids finish their school year in another school out there because they're going to have to eventually do it anyway. We're going to keep the family together. We're going to go together so we can be together. Um, the, the kids, that will give them a head start for next year to make friends, and so you can put a positive spin on anything. Your marriage is more important. Or you may turn the job down. <laughs> 
You may be like, no, it's not worth it. We're not going to do this. We're not going to split the family and fragment the family. You may say, hey, you may think of something out of the box. Like, you know, let's, let's homeschool the kids the rest of the year. Or let them do virtual school. But, but you got to work it out. You say, well, I know somebody who did that and it worked out fine. And it might, but it might not. Because, I mean, I know someone right now, very well, very close friend. And her husband came down here and she stayed up north for several months because he had a new job. He found a new woman while he was down here. 25 years of marriage and two kids still at home. Found a new woman. They weren't together on a daily basis. So he found someone else. So it may work, it may not. It may lead to the demise of your marriage. What am I saying? I'm saying this, that, you know, that, that's a risk. Because couples, in your handout it says, couples have to spend ample amounts of time together. You, you, that's true anyway. And that's especially true when you're going through change or problems. You, you have to tackle these things together. When you encounter change or trials, you've got to tackle it together. Um, look at this verse on the screen, Ecclesiastes 4, 9 and 10. I love this. It says, two are better than one because there's a good reward for their labor together. For if they fall... The one will lift up his companion, but woe to him who is alone when he falls and has no one to help him up. You know, you may have heard this, that trials in life can make us bitter or better. Your problems can make you a bitter person or a better person. That's up to you. And that applies to marriage. Change and trials can strengthen your marriage. Change in trials can weaken it and lead to its demise. It's really up to you. I've also heard it said that trials and problems can either draw us closer to God or trials and problems can drive us further away from God. And the same is true in marriage. Trials can either bring you closer together in your marriage or can drive you apart. But the point is this. You must go through change and trials together. Be together be together. Listen, where there's a will, there's a way. You got to stay together through changes, through trials. Stay together like glue. Don't let them separate you. Look at Ephesians 5. Look at verse 31. It says there, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife and the two shall be one Flesh. Now look, that is not something just up here in your head. That is something that God wants you to live out on a daily basis. He wants you to live out that oneness and be together on a daily basis. You can't go for days and days and days and not be together if you're married. Listen, being married means that you left your singleness, you left your singlehood behind and you chose to be married. You chose to come together. And be one flesh with another person. And so God wants you to demonstrate and live out that, that oneness on a daily basis. You're one flesh. So you have to stick together through the changes and trials of life. Be together and don't let those changes or those trials separate you. Amen, church? Amen. Number two, the second principle is always be on the same page. Through the trial, through the problem, through the change, be on the same page and function as a team through every change and trial. Now, most of you in here played sports, even if it was just in PE class, you played sports. Um, and you know if you played football, baseball, soccer, you were on the swimming team, you played, uh, you know, Basketball. <laughs> yeah. If you ever played on a team, you know this. Now, I've played on a lot of teams, and I've coached a lot of teams as my kids grew up. You learn a lot about your teammates when the team goes through adversity. When everyone's winning, you don't learn so much. You know? But when adversity strikes, you find out about your teammates. You find out who has your back. You find out 
who's a griper and a complainer. You find out who's got a bad attitude, and it was there all the time, but when they're winning, it just didn't show. But now that you're losing, that bad attitude comes to the service. You find out who's all about themselves. You find out who's going to melt down under pressure. You find out a lot about your teammates when adversity strikes. Same thing in marriage. When adversity strikes your life, it's then that you have to come together. It's then that you have to say, hey, we're a team here, and we're going to take a team approach to this. Now, let me tell you, that requires communication. Last week's message was all about that. If you, did, if you missed last week, you really ought to go back and catch that online because we talk all about words. Do you all remember that verse, death and life are in the power of the tongue? How many of you remember that last week? Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Communication. Communicating, remember we said last week, to build up. Communicating words that bring health and life to people. Uh, being a good listener, that's part of communication. And so we talked all about that. So it requires communication. Um, it requires give and take. Give and take. It may require patience. It may require waiting until both spouses come to an agreement and they're on the same page. For example, one spouse wants to have kids. The other one doesn't want to have children yet. Wait patiently. Keep those lines of communication open. Be on the same team. One spouse wants to move to a different area of the country. The other spouse doesn't want any part of it. You're going to have to wait. You're going to have to wait. You're going to have to put that on the back burner because you've got to be on the same team. Too many couples go through change or trials as if they're on opposing sides. You know what I mean? Um, it's it's kind of like, the you know, if, if, you, if you've ever watched much football... You know that, say that's the football, and you got the football right there, right? And that, that's called, you want to help me a minute? <laughs> come here, honey. <laughs> My wife's going to come help me for a minute, all right? This is more realistic because we're husband and wife, all right? All right, so you got the line of scrimmage right here, right? You know what that is, right? Yeah, you've watched football. You know what that is. So you, the football's here, the line of scrimmage here. On one side, you have the offense, and the offense has the ball and is trying to move it which way? This way. That way, right. <laughs> you got the defense, and they're trying to keep them from going that way and, in fact, push them back the other way. <laughs> so you got the line of scrimmage, and then you got the offense over here and the defense over here, and they're on opposing sides. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And they're, they're just, they call this the trenches. They're in the trenches and they're fighting, you know. Yeah. And she's trying to move it that way and I'm trying to move her back that way. Somebody took a picture of us like that in the first service and sent it to us from the balcony up there. So I don't know what's going on up there. But, but here's, the, here's the thing. It's a wonderful, glorious day when you realize, hold on. We're married. We're one flesh. We are not on opposite sides of the line of scrimmage. We are on the same team. Yeah. That's a great day. Amen. That is a wonderful day when you realize, hey, we're in this together. We're on the same team. Amen. We're going to move that ball this way. Let's go. <laughs> That's a great day when that happens. Great day. She had no clue. She had a little bit of a clue this service because I did it last night. She had no clue I was going to do that this morning to her. I didn't tell her because I knew if I asked her, she'd tell me no. So I just put her on the spot. <laughs> but uh, it's a great day when you realize, no, we're on the same team. You say, Pastor Dan, why do we get that way? Because we've all done that in our marriage where we're, we're opposing each other. And we're like on different sides. Why do we do that? Well, I think sometimes it's a lack of communication. You know, we don't talk things through. Um, I think sometimes it happens when one marriage partner wants their way at all costs. You know, they want their way. And that goes back many times to childhood. We're used to getting our own way. Mom and dad always gave us our own way when we threw a fit. And you know what spoiled kids become? Spoiled adults, <laughs> right, that want their own way, 
Exactly. And I think sometimes that, that's part of it. And, and I think what happens is we, we make everything adversarial. You know, we're not on the same team. And I want to say this to you. If say there some changes you have control over, some you don't have control over. But let's say it's a change that you have. Say you're going to buy a house. Right? You're going to buy a new house. And what happens is if you're not agreed on the change, if you're not on the same team, and then one of the spouses forges on ahead without the other one, if, if the decision is a disaster, then the spouse that was against it blames their spouse and can get bitter at them. If the change ends up working, it ends up being a success, then the spouse that forged on ahead gets kind of prideful and puffed up and says, yeah, I knew it. I told you so. <laughs> and I just leave the decisions up to me in this house and everything will work out just fine. <laughs> And that can lead them to continue making decisions independent of their spouse, which leads to more conflict. So I want you to remember this. Married couples, especially those of you who are younger in here, take some advice from somebody who's been married over 30 years. And I want you to remember this. Life is going to have its wins and losses. You are not going to rack up wins every day. You're just not. There's going to be job losses. There's going to be financial reversals. There's going to be bad investments. There's going to be problems with your kids. There's going to be sickness. There's going to be unexpected trials. But here's the deal. Life's going to have its wins and its losses, but you want those wins and losses to be together. Hey, if we made a bad decision and it blew up, we lost as a team. Mm -hmm. We blew it together. We were both fully engaged in this. We're on the same team. If we win, we all love to win. But if we make a good decision and we win, we get to rejoice together in it. We get to celebrate together in it. Because again, we were both fully engaged in this and on the same page. Satan wants you and your spouse to become adversarial during the changes and trials of life. But don't allow that to happen. Look with me in your, hand, in your Bible, Ephesians 5.33. Look at that last verse in that chapter. Ephesians 5.33. It's on the screen also. It says, however, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respect her husband. Do you see the two key words in that verse? What are they? Love and respect. That's what a marriage is built upon. In other words, you're not going to act independently of your spouse when it comes to change your trials. Why? You love and respect them too much. You, you look at things from their point of view, and you respect that. What happens in marriages is... Is that when you're dating and you're first married, that love and respect is there. And over time, that love and respect can go away. You don't treat each other with love and respect. And so you're not on the same team. You're not on the same page. And it becomes adversarial. Everything's adversarial. Instead of realizing, no, no, this is stupid. This is ignorant. We are not on opposing sides here. We're on the same team. Number three is this. And when you're going through change and trials... And you want to navigate through those successfully. Number three, stay intimate through every change and trial of life. This is so important. Um, unfortunately, when life gets crazy, one of the first things to go for many married, young married couples, for older married couples, middle-aged married couples, makes no difference. But many times when the trials and the changes come, the first thing to go is that, that physical closeness, that intimacy. You know, you're stressed out. You're, you're busy. And we did an entire sermon in this series on the importance of sex and marriage and God's intention for that. It's God's idea. It's not dirty. It was God's idea. And, and God's the one that implemented that. And he did it for a reason. He did it for a purpose. Look at Ephesians 5.28. Everybody go back there and let's read a few verses here. Ephesians 5.28 says, 
In this way, men ought to love their wives as their own bodies, for he who loves, it says, he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord cares for the church. For we are members of his, God, of Christ's body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. You are one flesh with your spouse. That sexual intimacy is what makes the marriage bond so unique and so special. And as we said earlier, when you're going through trials and you're going through change, you, you have to spend time together, stay close emotionally. You can't be distant and apart for day after day after day. You've got to stay together. But then you also have to stay close physically, sexually, if you will. Those hugs, those kisses, those warm embraces, that intimacy, that brings a sense of security and comfort in that relationship. When the, when the marriage bed is strong, it brings a sense of oneness in which you feel like you can face anything together. Why? Because it's a physical expression of that oneness. It's a, it's a physical reminder of the oneness that you enjoy as a married couple. You know, 1 Corinthians 7, we did a whole study of that passage. And 1 Corinthians 7 talks about the husband and the wife rendering to each other due affection. Talks about not depriving each other sexually and the importance of coming together regularly so Satan doesn't tempt you. You see, when couples, when couple, hear me now. When couples become strangers in the bedroom, it brings an emotional separation and detachment. That will wear on the relationship. And you can become like sandpaper to each other. Every little thing becomes an issue. Especially when you're going through changes or trials. So you've got to keep that part of your marriage strong. That's what God intended. Through changes and trials, I know you may be very busy. You may be stressed out. But you've got to come together and keep that strong. Last thing is this, number four. When you're going through change or trials, protect your spouse and always have their best interest at heart. You know, I remember when Denise and I, um, when the kids were in grade school, the two youngest ones were in grade school, you know, Denise has very, been very healthy and extremely energetic. She's got so much energy. And, and she's been very healthy. But there's been a couple times, I told you about the first two years of our marriage when she got mono. There was another time when our kids were little when she got really sick, really sick. We didn't know what was wrong. None of the doctors could diagnose it. But she uh, you know, was losing weight uh, just rapidly. She was sick. She was just so sick. And remember, we didn't know what was wrong. And we look back. We never did get a diagnosis. We think it was a virus probably in her system that just had to work its way out. She finally got better, you know, but it took some time. And I remember during that time period when she was homeschooling our kids, and I said, honey, I think you should put the kids in school because you don't need that extra stress. You just, you really can't do that right now. You need, and she really didn't want to do that. And, and I wasn't going to make her do it because, again, you got to be on the same page. You have to be a team, right? And, but finally she's like, you know, you're right. And we were on the same page. Yep, we need to put them in school. So we put them in school, and eventually she got better. And she was able to go back to homeschooling, and, you know, trial was over. But here's my point. I was trying to watch out for her. I was trying to protect her. And, and I want to I make a statement right now that you need to remember, married couples. Here it is. You ready? I've got it on the screen. If change is good for you, and bad for your spouse, then it's bad. When a change is good for both of you, then it's good. Never forget that. If something's going to benefit you personally, but it's not good for your spouse, then it's just not good, period. Don't do it. But if it's good for both of you, then it's good. And that's the principle of Ephesians 5.28. Look at it with me. Ephesians 5.28 says, In this way, men ought to love their wives as their own bodies. 
He who loves his wife loves himself. You're one flesh. If it's bad for Denise, we're one flesh. If it's bad for her, it's bad for, it's bad for us. If it's good for both of us, then it's good. That may be good for me, but if it's good for me and bad for her, it's bad. If it's good for her and bad for me, it's bad. But if it's good for both of us, then it's good. You know, change is never easy. <laughs> Would y'all agree this has been a year of changes? <laughs> yeah. Change is never easy. And usually we don't want it. <laughs> Some changes are good. Many are very trying. Some seem really good at the time. And then it presents, the, presents a whole new set of challenges. It's like, you, you, we want a kid. We want to have a child. And of course you're thrilled when you have that child. But it doesn't take long to realize life will never be the same again as we have known it. You know, it's like, we got a new job. Opportunity. More money. Woo! And then all of a sudden, you read the fine print. And you realize, wait a minute. It's going to be a lot more hours. Wait a minute, this means I'm going to have to be gone two or three nights a week. Wait a minute, this means I'm going to miss my kids' ball games. I'm going to miss their piano recitals. So some changes seem good, but then they're not so good. But here's the most important thing that a husband and wife can do. The most important thing, and this is something that Denise and I have learned, this has served us well. Over 30 years of marriage. And this has served us well. You ready for this? The most important thing is that a husband and wife both have a relationship and a walk with Jesus Christ. Amen. Because if both of you are seeking after Jesus, you're, you're a Christ follower, you are following Jesus. If you're both doing that before the trial ever comes, before the change ever comes, because they're coming. But if you're following Jesus before the trial ever comes, he'll guide your heart. He'll guide your mind through that. And he'll keep you strong. He'll keep you strong. Change is a season. We go through several changes and seasons, don't we? We go through them all the time. If we learn how to navigate through those changes, putting into practice what we learned today, it will make the future changes less intimidating and stressful. You'll know that with God and with your spouse, you can make it through this trial or this change as a, as a team. Amen, church? Amen. You know, I had a couple people tell me this week. I gave that message on communication about words last week. It was real practical. <laughs> you know, about how to sit down, how to work through stuff, how to listen, blah, blah, blah. And I had a couple of couples that told me this week, they said, Pastor Dan, we actually sat down with your handout, with your message, and just absolutely did everything you said in the handout step by step. And said we were able to sit down and communicate more effectively than we ever have before, work out our problems, and resolve issues. The reason why I say that is because that thrills my heart. When people actually take what they're learning on Sunday and immediately say, I'm going to implement this. And this is one of those messages that you can take this and immediately discuss it. There's discussion questions on the back. You can discuss it. You can talk about it. And, and many of you are going through change or trials right now. And you can work through those as a team, work them together, and put into practice what you learned today. Let's pray. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you, God, and we thank you for your word today. And we just pray, God, that you will help us to have your grace to implement it into our life. Help us not to just be hearers of the word, but doers. To actually put into practice what we're learning. Particularly, Lord, in our marriages, Lord. I know that in a crowd this size, there has to be people, Lord, right now, they're struggling in their marriage. It's on life support right now. But Lord, if we will implement what we heard today, if we'll just put into practice what we've heard, it can make a huge difference in our marriage and our life to get it heading in the right direction. Lord, I know we're not going to fix every problem overnight, 
but at least we can get things moving in the right direction again. Lord, by having the right attitude, the right mindset, the right biblical perspective on these things. So God, help us. We love you. We thank you for this time that we had to worship you, to learn your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, Clayton's got an announcement he'd like to make. Man, it's an exciting one. Why don't you it share is. that with us? Um, church, aren't you thankful that we have a church that stands firm on God's word? Amen. 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 You're thankful that my dad preaches the word every single week. What a blessing. But, you know, there's, there's like 2,000 people groups who have yet to have a Bible in their own language. And last year, we partnered with Wycliffe Bible Translators uh, to support a team of translators translating the Bible uh, into the Tingir people group. And this year, for our Christmas offering, we're going to be doing the same thing with a new people group. In 1988, um, John and Bonnie Nystrom went to the village of Arab. And you'll see a picture on the screen of Arab. And this is located in Papua New Guinea. Um, this is a mountainous region. Papua New Guinea is, um, has a many, many people groups. And they each have their own language. And because it's mountainous, that's why you have all these different people groups, because they're separated geographically. And so John and Bonnie, um, they went to Arab in 1988, and they began to work to translate the Bible for the Arab people group. But then tragedy struck in 1998. A tsunami hit Papua New Guinea, and 2,000 people were killed. Yeah, 2,000 people. You'll see pictures of translation work that had been going on, but then the tsunami came. 2,000 people were killed. And John and Bonnie asked themselves, what can God do through this? God doesn't send tragedies our way, but when they come, God's able to work through that. And so they asked themselves, what can we do to allow God to work through this situation? Well, shortly before the tsunami had hit, two neighboring villages had come to the Nystroms, and they were wanting their village to be able to have a Bible as well. They're like, hey, can you do this? And they were trying to communicate, but they couldn't really understand each other. But John and Bonnie said, listen, we can't really do that right now because we're trying to focus on what's going on right here in Arab. But then the tsunami hit, and then they decided, you know what? What if we widened our scope? What if we changed the vision? And so they located 11 different people groups, neighboring villages, and they began work to translate the Bible into not one, but 11 Ooh, hey. different languages. Yeah, wow. And so what they formed was uh, the Itape hey. translation team. You'll see pictures of translation work that happens inside of Arab, where all 11 different communities come together hey. to work on the Bible to translate scripture into every single one of their communities. And uh, we are really excited. Uh, Crossroads is so excited to be able to partner with Wycliffe to support this translation team as the work is still going on. It takes a, a long time to translate even into one language. They're, they're working on 11. And so we're going to be supporting this translation team Everything that, that you give during our Christmas offering is going to go to support this team to provide a Bible for 11 different languages. I mean, everyone in this room, how many of you believe that the Bible changes lives? Amen. Yeah. Amen. And I can't even imagine not having a Bible. And so this year, we're going to be able to partner to bring a Bible into 11 different languages. Languages. Church, are you excited about this opportunity? So exciting. I'm, I'm pumped about it. Right outside the doors to your right, we've got prayer cards. We want to support this financially, but we also want to support prayerfully. If you talk to the translators, they'll tell you prayer is the most important factor. The work will continue on as long as there are people who are praying. So I, heard, I encourage you. Um, grab a prayer card on your way out or grab two or three, however many you want, and start praying for this Itape translation team. And Dad, you're talking about giving. Yeah, while you're getting ready for our last song, just, you know, the Christmas offering isn't officially till December 6th.
But you can give that Christmas offering any time in the month of December is fine. If you want to give online, there'll be a drop-down box, you know, where you have your general giving. And you can just also select, you know, the Christmas offering and give online. You can text. You can also just use the offering envelopes that are in the chairs or that we sent you in the mail. Uh, and you can put your offering with check or cash in those offering envelopes and give that at any time you want to. And like I said, none of that's going to stay here. Uh, that's going to all go uh, to help with this translation project. Last year we did this. And like he said, we were helping to get the Bible translated for a people group that is in an area and they have no Bible at all. And uh, that translation is going great. Uh, it is really moving forward. Clayton had said they had, what, 17 books of the New Testament done now. And uh, last year we gave about $125,000 towards that translation project. And so this year, again, we want to support this project in Papua New Guinea. So be praying about what God would have you to do to be a part of that uh, for our Christmas offering this year. Thank you in advance for your help. We appreciate it. Let's all stand.
Jesus, we love you. We thank you for this time of worship. God, thank you for showing us who you are in your word, for revealing us your nature, who you are. God, now send us out to be your hands and feet, Lord, to show your love to everyone we meet. God, we want to glorify you with our lives. So we ask for your spirit's direction as we leave and your blessing upon us as we go our separate ways. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless, church. Thanks for coming.